thanks for coming, Steve. So you are the LSAT blog guy and you are an LSAT specialist. And I think it's so interesting because basically you've kind of made a career over making sure you're successful on the LSAT. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a long journey. I was, I got into this because I was considering law school myself mm -hmm. and then started teaching the LSAT and really loved it. And so that kind of just snowballed and that's what I've been doing ever since over 10 years now. Wow. So I just have to ask you before we get into the nitty gritty, what do you love about teaching the LSAT? I love that it's possible to improve on it and actually change your way of thinking. Like at first it seems like it's totally Greek or something, something alien almost. Mm -hmm. And it's not really related to how we talk and think in our everyday lives. So at first you could be like, oh, this is a dumb exam, doesn't test anything, it's impossible. But then through exposure and repetition, you can actually come to understand and appreciate it, especially I think the logic games, the puzzles, they're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so getting good at those, especially not being a math person by nature, I really enjoyed it. It was really gratifying to, to learn those. That's really cool. And I think you know, that's the thing because they don't teach to the LSAT in undergraduate school. They teach stuff, but not thinking so much um at least you know maybe you can take a logics course but they don't necessarily teach to the lsat and that's why lsat prep is so important um and the other reason of course lsat prep is so important is that you want to be as prepared as possible because the higher your lsat either the better u.s news and world report school although i'm not a big fan of u.s news world report reporting or you know the better your scholarship package will be so it's important to really do well on the lsat um, so I think that this is really good. But, you know, in going through, you know, you're, you have a blog and you're on YouTube and I saw you're on Reddit and you really you make yourself so accessible in a way that some of the commercial bar courses don't necessarily. So I'm wondering, what's your mission in all of this? It's so interesting to me. Thanks. And my, my mission is just to basically release as much free LSAT information as I possibly can. That's kind of been the idea all along. When I started my website back in 2008, there were actually no other real LSAT blogs online. Hmm. It was a long time ago. And so I just thought, you know what? I have got nothing to lose. I'm not a big prep company. I'm just going to give away everything I know. And then a small, small percentage of people will come along. Maybe they'll want tutoring. Maybe they'll want a, a course or something. But the internet makes the cost of distribution nothing almost. So I figured, why not? And with every new medium that, that comes along, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or whatever else, I just thought, how can I use this to spread more LSAT knowledge. YouTube has actually my, my, been my focus lately, but I actually just started a podcast recently with another LSAT instructor. Oh, you did? Yeah, it's yeah, called LSAT right. Pros. We just, we just got approved by iTunes this, this past weekend. And so Congratulations. Getting, getting into the podcast game now, but yeah, it's just a lot of fun releasing more information. I want it to be that, let's say I, I get hit by a car or I'm not available. All my LSAT knowledge will still be out there recorded forever. And so that's kind of my goal with this. All right. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. What's the name of your podcast? So the podcast is LSAT Pros. And it's a lot of fun. It's me and another LSAT instructor, Graham Blake. And we're basically just covering real student questions. We're covering, they're, each episode is about an hour long. We've released three so far. And we're just discussing students' questions. We cover about six or seven per episode on average, although that may change. But yeah, we're just covering questions that come up and sharing our thoughts on them. It's a free-form discussion. That's very cool. All right. So that's a great segue into getting into something that will be of helpful to my listeners. Um, what are some of the top questions that people have about the LSAT? People ask me which materials they should use. They ask if it's worth retaking. They ask if it's possible to improve what kind of score you need. So I can answer some of those. Um, to start with um, materials, the number one biggest thing you need is real LSAT prep tests. They're published by LSAC. Most of them are available in books of 10 for about 20 bucks each. The others are individual, a bit more expensive, but they're well worth it because if just a single question gives you or exam gives you an insight into your studying, that gets you a few more points, that could change everything. As you said earlier, getting into a better law school, getting more scholarship money, it's a drop in the bucket. 20 bucks for a book of exams, totally worth it. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and Ella, I'm just going to interrupt you and say LSAC is the Law School Admission Council. And the Law School Admission Council is the group that administers the LSAT, but they're very, I actually work with them quite often, and they're very committed to making sure students have all the access they need to do well. And, um, you know, one of the concerns in LSAT prep and SAT prep is kind of the socioeconomic discrimination 
And so that's another place where uh, um, the Law School Admission Council, LSAC, is really strong in making sure it's kind of um, equally distributed. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely doing their best. If you have a fee waiver, they give you a book for free. And either way, they have a free exam online, the June 2007 LSAT currently. And so that's a great resource. They actually just put it in a digital format because the LSAT's becoming a digital exam later this year. And so that's a great option for students who just need something and don't have money or don't have a book yet or overseas, whatever. You can always do that exam. And you want to make sure when you're looking for other resources that they're using real LSAT questions because there's nothing like the real thing. These questions are very carefully constructed, very tough to mimic. And so you want to make sure when you're using another prep book out there, make sure they say on it, it's real LSAT questions. And they even tell you the prep test number and the date and year it was administered. Perfect. All right. So that's a really excellent tip. The most important tip is make sure when you're prepping, you're doing it with real LSAT questions. Great. Um, What's something else that's important? Well, it's important to invest enough time in studying. A lot of times students will take the exam just to see how they'll do Mm -hmm. and then be discouraged when, of course, they don't do well. The LSAT, Mm -hmm. like I said, it's like a foreign language. It requires a whole different way of thinking, and it takes time to adopt that. And so Mm -hmm. even spending one month or two months isn't really enough typically to achieve your fullest potential. I would want Mm -hmm. students to spend at least three to six months studying for this exam. It's well worth it. It's the biggest factor in law school admissions. And so when people ask how long, could I just take it in January or March and be done with it? I would say you could be done with it whenever you want, but if you want to reach your fullest potential, it's worth spending a bit more time, even if that means delaying your law school applications an entire year Mm -hmm. by the beginning of the cycle, then you have more scholarship money available because the pool has not yet been tapped and you're first in line. Law schools appreciate you taking initiative starting early and they want to secure your admission, especially if you're way above their median. That's excellent advice. I've been on the admissions committee for my school, and I think that that's really strong advice, especially the idea that you're, you know, you're up there early, you're up there first um, in app applying. Another thing, and this is interesting, this has kind of changed over the years. It used to be that they would take, if you took it twice, they'd take the two and they'd average it. Now they take the best score of, of the group. But I think there's a point at which, and I can only speak for my school, there's a point at which you say, well, you've taken it so many times, you know, it just, it's, it, it, so I wouldn't be a serial LSAT taker. Of course not. I agree. I think that from what I've heard from yourself and other admission professor, professionals as well, maybe three or four times is a good number at most. But if you start taking five, six, seven times, it starts to look a little nuts. So I'd yeah. say, yeah, if you have maybe three, num- three scores on your record and one cancellation, maybe that's enough. The question is, if you're going to retake, what are you truly going to do differently this time around? And if you had family distractions or career distractions and competing priorities getting in the way, that's understandable. But are you truly going to be able to change that next time around? If you can reorient and reorganize your life and your schedule, then it could be worth giving it another shot. But if you just, you're just hoping by, by luck or chance to improve a couple of points, it may or may not happen. So you want to make sure you're studying right and you take it only when you're truly ready. And yeah, the, the averaging is no longer the case. Unfortunately, there are still some schools that say they average, even though from everything I hear, they really don't. Because again, the U.S. news rankings do determine so much, unfortunately, that the good news is law schools only take the highest. So if you take it, get a 150, then a 170, the 170 matters. It's what they count and it's well worth it. Right. Excellent, excellent points. Let's talk a little bit about cancellation because I know that people go in thinking I can cancel and should I cancel? And I also saw that you wrote a little bit about that. So what do you say? Well, let's explain first what cancellation means and then what um, you say to students when they're thinking about canceling their scores. Yeah, sure. So let's say you took the LSAT and you didn't. Do, you feel like you didn't do well. That could be a couple of things. Maybe something catastrophic happened like the fire alarm went off, there was a marching band outside, where the proctors were super distracting and didn't know what they were doing. If that happened, those could all be cases where cancellations are warranted because you, you just basically know that you didn't score nearly close to where you typically score where you want to. If that's the case, fine, go ahead and cancel. But if instead you just have this vague sense of unease that something went wrong, but you can't put your finger on it, or maybe one particular logic game or one particular reading comprehension passage just didn't go as well as it could have, then I would say don't cancel. Maybe it's all in your head, or maybe it affected you by a couple of points. But since law schools don't average, 
there's really no downside to having the score on your record. And a lot of people who've ended up getting great scores, and I'm talking like 99th percentile scores, they had that vague sense of unease and they considered canceling. And it's a good thing they didn't because they ended up with great scores on the record and they were done. So that, that's my, my thoughts. Generally, students who are considering canceling on average should not cancel most of the yeah. time. It's so interesting that you point that out because there's, um, in law school, we kind of have a saying that the worse you think you did, the better off you probably did on the exam. So in other words, if you walk out of an exam and say, I aced it, chances are you didn't ace it. And the reason why is you didn't look deeply enough at all the different tricks and, and you know, nooks and crannies of, of analysis. And if you think that you failed it, it's probably because you saw the overwhelming nature of all the material that we were asking you to identify. And so it sounds like the same is absolutely true with the LSAT, that if you think you did badly, you probably think you did badly because you knew enough to know what it takes to do super well. Um, so that's really good advice. Yeah, because I do know a bunch of people who, um, a bunch of students who just kind of cancel and, and out of understandable insecurity, I'm not going to fault them because, you know, I get it. But to your point, and this is a really good one, now that law schools take the highest score, there's no reason to cancel. Unless Absolutely. you have like the flu or something, yeah. So. yeah there's, there's no reason to cancel most of the time. And the funny thing is that those who do the best on the LSAT, it's because they're critical and skeptical of everything. And that includes themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could have, you know, part of getting better at the LSAT is becoming more humble in what you can reasonably infer based on a situation or a set of facts and what you can't reasonably infer. And so mm -hmm. that sense of not knowing mm -hmm. how you did, mm -hmm. it's extremely stressful and that's understandable. And you don't want to avoid a disastrous score that would make you feel bad about yourself. Sure. Right. Better to have a vague cancellation than a definite low score. But the thing is, it's actually not definitely a low score. Mm -hmm. And even if it's a few points where, below where you wanted it to be, no big deal. You can always retake. Right. Excellent point. All right, so we have a student and the student's ready to take the LSAT. I guess the first question is, should that student engage in some kind of commercial bar program or tutoring program? What would you say to that student? Yeah, sure. So let's say you're starting off, you've done no prep yet. The mm -hmm. first thing I would do is do some practice questions of each type. I'm not saying to do a full length diagnostic because the results can often be discouraging, like I said before. Right. It only tells you that you don't know anything yet. But let's say you want to score in the 170s and you're, you start off with like a 150. Then I would say you've got a long way to go and you would want to arm yourself with the best resources possible. And so I'd say definitely number one, like I said before, actual old LSAT exams. But then I would also get some sort of resource or guide or course to give you the fundamentals of each section. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which one it is. If you were going to choose some sort of course or book, I would choose one published by or created by a company that specializes in the LSAT exclusively. Mm -hmm. Bigger companies out there, they teach every exam under the sun and they're not as specialized or focused on the LSAT in particular. But my understanding is that the LSAT is uniquely difficult among other exams like the GRE, the GMAT, the SAT, and you want someone who really has made it their mission to understand this exam in depth rather than just copying the same reading comprehension technique they may be using for a different exam. Wow, that's a good point. That's a really good point, actually, yeah. So that's the number one thing I would say. Mm -hmm. You want to, again, you want to have real LSAT exams. You want to have a strict, detailed study plan so that you mm -hmm. know exactly what to do every single day over the course of your prep. Mm -hmm. When I first started my website, I put out some free week-by-week -week schedules for those who were studying, and people really liked them, found them helpful to know exactly what to do. But then they asked me even more, like, we want day by day what to do, like Monday, right. Tuesday, Wednesday. And I thought, that's nuts. Like, I can't tell you how to divide your week, but right. people really want to know it. So several years ago, I actually finally listened to my audience and created day by day study plans for periods of one month up to seven months so that students know which prep test questions they should complete, which articles on my site they should read, which prep books they should use, et cetera, and even down to page numbers. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are spinning their wheels and just not sure where to go. Mm -hmm. But if you can study systematically, then mm -hmm. you can make real progress. I mean, not so crazy, by the way, because I actually have students come into my, so I'm a law professor, and I have students come into my office, and we will sit down during final semester, and we will literally write down every single thing to like having dinner with your parents or calling them 
um, you know, sh taking a run and then I'm going to do outlining here and I'm going to do practice questions here and I'm going to study only towards here. So um, I think that's a great service. I really think that's an excellent and well needed service. So that leads me to the question of, um, let's say that I would like to hire you. What would you do? How would you help me to do better on my LSAT than I might have done on my own? Yeah, sure. So let's say you were a student of mine. The first thing I'd want to do is discuss each of the sections in general a bit to get a sense of your conceptual understanding, like to diagnose where you stand on each section. Maybe there are certain question types you might have certain misconceptions about. And mm -hmm. so if I can spot one of those misconceptions, or let's say I can help you find a better approach, mm -hmm. then that could change everything. What I find with students is that a lot of times they have the fundamentals, they have the foundation, but one thing is a little bit off. Mm -hmm. Maybe they misinterpreted something. Maybe they were using a prep book that contained a mistake or they heard hearsay from a forum or something like that. So I would want to check each of those areas and spot where those gaps in understanding are. Because mm -hmm. a single insight like that can mm -hmm. change everything. For example, a lot of students get confused about necessary assumption versus sufficient assumption questions. If we can spot the difference and truly understand the proper perspective from which to view each, we could totally change your approach to the entire logical reasoning section. Mm -hmm. So I'd be looking for those sorts of things. And then in general, critiquing your study plan, helping you lay out a schedule, but most importantly, helping you engage in proper in-depth review mm -hmm. of every single question you get wrong or have difficulty with. Mm -hmm. What is tempting about the wrong answer that makes you pick it? What ultimately makes it wrong? And on yes. the flip side, what's discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it? and what ultimately makes it correct. Mm -hmm. A lot of times students just do exam after exam, then being happy, measuring the results and being happy or sad about them and then moving on. Mm -hmm. But the real work is in the review process. And I, I really force my students to engage in that review process. Together, we walk through the biggest problems they face each week in between our sessions. And that's where the progress happens. Wow, that's wonderful. And you know, going back to what you said in the beginning, every question you get right could be another few dollars in your scholarship pocket. Um, and so, you know, and, and I think, I don't know, maybe you could speak to this. This is kind of an emotional question, but I feel like because students are getting scholarships from, L from their LSAT scores, that it adds an additional pressure to the process. That it used to be that doing well in an LSAT, yes, it's better to go to the school of your choice than not get into the school of your choice. And a good LSAT may help you get into that school of your choice. But now it's also tied to a financial package. And with law school being as, as expensive as it is, so I'm wondering, do you see that emotional component? And if so, what do you say to students who have that fear, if any? Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely real. And it's understandable. But what I would say is you can look at it as a stress-adding stress adding factor, or you can look at it as potentially as motivation. Mm -hmm. You can look at it as motivation Well, like, I could be, instead of procrastinating, you know that the score has a value. Right. And so you could look at it as an incentive to study ever harder. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, just to reduce the stress a bit, here's what I would say. There's, the LSAT is important in general. It's maybe the most important factor in your law school admissions. But no particular LSAT test date is especially important. You can always retake. You can always withdraw your score. You can always postpone. And so knowing that, you can walk into any test administration saying, you know what, however I do, not the end of the world. There's always another LSAT test date in the future. And so treat that one as a practice run if that's what it ends up having to be. Right. And, and, and to be fair, it's not all about the LSAT. I mean, and, the, or, and or the GPA. You know, we look at the whole student and we look at the student's interest level and we look at the student's mission, and we look at what the student has done um, in the student's past experiences. So, you know, the LSAT is important, and I don't want to minimize it. It's super important. And I just want to speak to that a little bit, um, even though I know I'm interviewing you, but one of the things that I think is unfortunate for academic admissions processes is that it's so easy to measure someone by these objective LSAT GPA factors. And I think that that's one of the default re reasons for putting so much emphasis on them because there's so many people who apply, but it's important to keep in mind that that's not who you are. You are not your LSAT, you are not your LSAT number and that 
as law school admissions, we try desperately, and I say this from years in the academy, to look beyond that. And so no one should ever let their LSAT define who they are. And the other thing I want to say is that, and I think you can agree with this, your success on the LSAT has absolutely no bearing on what kind of lawyer you're going to be. It has bearing on what kind of law school you'll get into, but it doesn't have any bearing at all on the kind of lawyer you will be once you get out of practice. 100%. I could not agree more. First off, your LSAT score can change. You can improve. Mm -hmm. So therefore, by nature, it's not an innate characteristic of who you are. So right. that's, the, that's the first thing I would say. Second of all, there is a margin of error of three points on either end for any given LSAT score. So mm -hmm. let's say you score a 170. Next day, you could score a 173. Following day, you could score a 167. So there's a six-point range. So where's the true number? Who knows? There is an element of luck as well as just how you woke up that morning. Right. And finally, this exam is a total, I mean, I, I won't say it's arbitrary or irrelevant. It does have some bearing on law school, mm -hmm. but that has nothing to do with your practice as a lawyer. There's so much more to your career success, how you, how you are with people, what your personality is like, your networking abilities, how your just your general work ethic. The LSAT is simply a measure of how hard you study for the LSAT and if you study the right way for the LSAT. And there's a certain value to having that bar set by law schools. You need to have some objective measure, I think. Right. But, and I, I'm not saying the LSAT is, is nonsense because I think it's a, a good exam, but it still is just an exam. And so realize that once you are finished with it, you can move on with life and you'll forget about it altogether, most likely. That's right. I can't even tell you what I got on my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else that you want to pass along? I would say just... If you're having trouble with the LSAT and you're studying and you're not making any headway, don't lose hope. Like I said before, a single insight can change everything about your prep. And if anyone's having trouble, just feel free to reach out. I really do love hearing from students. I'm happy to help however I can. They can email me. They can visit my YouTube channel. They can listen to my podcast, whatever. I'm just happy to help students, anyone listening out there. And we're going to get to um, how students can reach you in just a moment, and I'll also put it on the um, podcast website, but, you know, one of the issues, and I think we touched on this before about the LSAT, is that there's a socioeconomic skew, for lack of a better word, in that people who can afford all the prep that they need tend to get it, and people who can't, can't. And so I think what you're doing is so in line with the mission of the LSAC, with the mission of a lot of schools, and just incredibly wonderful and thoughtful because what you're doing is you're getting access to everyone. I teach um, a summer class called New York, Legal Equal, New York Legal Equal Opportunity Program. It's for students who are um, students of color or otherwise members of an underrepresented minority who are about to go to any law school in New York State. And so many of them didn't even know that you could get help to take the LSAT. So you are spreading the word through so many channels and you're doing people a service and people should feel good about taking advantage of what you're offering because it makes the playing field so much more even. So I really, really admire and respect you. And I'm so thrilled that you took time to chat with me. Tell everybody how to get in touch with you. Email, podcast. Um, I have your blog, the whole thing. Yeah, sure. So again, my name is Steve Schwartz. I'm at the LSAT blog. Uh, anyone listening can reach me via email, lsatunplugged at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. I also have a YouTube channel, LSAT blog. Mm -hmm. And then the new podcast is LSAT Pros, P-R-O-S. And so just searching that in iTunes or Stitcher or your favorite podcast app, we're also on Spotify. And so anyone studying for the LSAT can listen there and hear more. That's great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Wait, I don't want to hang up because I want to ask you a few questions. But um, let me just summarize. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. It's well, my law, my um, my blog's primarily for law students, but I'm getting so much and um, so many requests about the LSAT. So I'm happy to have you as my first LSAT guest, and it's great to connect. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be with you as well today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.